He may be the only person in history who fell in love with flight because President Calvin Coolidge took a vacation. A baby-faced Swede who flew a trainer in a loop around the center span of the Golden Gate Bridge. He was a stunningly talented pilot. It was said of him that he thought more quickly in three dimensions than most people did in two. His string of combat victories over New Guinea turned him into a national hero. He shot down an incredible 40 enemy aircraft before being removed from combat once and for all. A national treasure who could no longer be risked on the battlefield. When the endless cycle of parades and war bond rallies wore him down, he asked for and received assignment as a test pilot in the secret program that produced America's first combat jet. He is Richard Ira Bong, and he is a legend of air power. Richard Ira Bong was born September 24, 1920 in Superior, Wisconsin. Superior is a small town at the western tip of Lake Superior and about as far north as you can be in Wisconsin without being in Minnesota. His father, Carl, had come to the United States from Sweden at the age of seven. He worked his way halfway across the continent before settling as a farmer in Poplar, Wisconsin, 20 miles to the southeast of Superior. Carl Bong married Dora Bryce and settled in to start a family. Richard was the first of their nine children, a quiet, thoughtful boy who grew up hunting and fishing in the dense forests around his family's farm. Known from an early age as Dick, he was first taken with aviation at the age of eight when President Calvin Coolidge decided to spend a summer vacation in Superior. And uh, every day the mail would be delivered uh, by a courier, uh, air courier, and uh, Richard saw the plane going over to every day and I think it just fascinated him and I think that was the start of his uh, love affair with aviation and it just built from there. When the presidential party left town, so did the air couriers, but aviation had made its impression on young Dick. He contented himself with building model airplanes and dreaming of the day when he would learn how to fly. He played basketball, baseball, and hockey. He was a fisherman and hunter played clarinet in the school band, and was active in the local 4-H club. He was, like almost everyone else in Poplar, a Lutheran, and he sang tenor in the choir every Sunday morning at Bethany Lutheran Church. Poplar was a town so small that its high school only lasted three years. To complete his senior year and make himself eligible for college and the civilian pilot training program, he commuted 44 miles round trip every day to Superior. In 1938, he graduated 18th in a class of more than 400. He attended Superior State Teachers College and enlisted in the civilian pilot training program. That government-sponsored flight training system was designed to boost the number of experienced pilots in the United States. The government justified the program based on the growing need for airmail and commercial pilots. In reality, the government's main concerns were the wars that were brewing in Europe and Asia. There was going to come a time, military planners believed, when the United States would need a lot of pilots quickly. Bong earned his pilot's license in a Piper J-3, and almost from the first showed a gift for aviation. He had a knack for it, and he learned that through the pilot training programs he had been in in college and, and afterwards, that uh, he was just a natural pilot, and that was the word that everybody used to describe him in all of his pilot training programs. He was just a natural pilot. He loved it, and it became evident uh, in the performance he turned in as a pilot. In 1941, Bong enlisted in the Army Air Aviation Cadet Program. In May, he shipped out to far-off and exotic California. He did his primary flight training in a Stearman biplane outside Tulare. He caught on quickly and moved on to flying Vultee BT-13s, the famous Vultee vibrator at Garner Field in Taft. 
He was, a, he was, as I said, a natural pilot. He had natural skills, natural abilities. And in those days, you didn't get a whole lot of instructions. Most of the pilots at Gardner simply flew, running up their hours and getting a feel for maneuvering in three dimensions. Bong quickly distinguished himself and was ordered to report for gunnery training. At Luke Field, near Phoenix, Arizona, he moved from the BT-13 to the AT-6, a single-engine fighter trainer that was smoother and more capable than the Baltese he'd been flying, but sluggish compared to real combat fighters. His gunnery trainer was Captain Barry Goldwater, the future senator and presidential candidate. Goldwater, a tough, precise teacher, said later that Bong was a talented pilot in those years, hunting with his Winchester rifle in Wisconsin had honed his shooting skills. But Bong really proved himself one afternoon in an informal, impromptu hassle high over Luke Field. Bong, flying an AT-6, squared off against a Czech pilot in a P-38. The dogfight should have been a mismatch. The P-38, after all, was much faster and more agile than the AT-6, and the Czech pilot had hundreds of hours more flight time than Bong. But no matter how the P-38 pilot maneuvered, he couldn't keep Bong off his tail. The two would square off, and in a few seconds, Bong would be closing in on the P-38 from behind. The Czech pilot upon landing pronounced Bong the best natural pilot he had ever seen. Bong was at Luke when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Like the other pilots, he wanted into the war as soon as he could get there. A month later, he received his wings and his officer's commission. But rather than sending him into combat, the Army kept him at Luke as a gunnery instructor. Dick Bong's war seemed to end before it had started. For almost six months after the American entry into World War II, Second Lieutenant Dick Bong was stuck stateside. As a gunnery instructor at Luke Field in Arizona, he trained other young fighter pilots and then watched as they departed for points unknown overseas. In May 1942, however, the Army Air Force assigned Bong to Hamilton Field in San Francisco. There, pilots were learning how to fly the new Lockheed P-38 Lightning Fighter. The P-38s were big, fast, and had proven themselves unsuitable for combat in Europe. The cooling systems for the plane's twin engines froze up at low temperatures common at altitudes over Europe. The pilots training in P-38s at Hamilton all understood where they were headed, the Pacific. After arriving at Hamilton, Bong quickly came to the attention of Major General George C. Kenney, commanding general of the 4th Air Force. Bong was both a gifted pilot and an incorrigible hot dog. On training flights, he liked to dip down low and buzz San Francisco's downtown. Showing off for the civilians seemed to be his greatest joy in life, and it got so bad that General Kenny put out an official order that such antics would not be tolerated. Well, as most pilots are prone to do, he, he disregarded that instruction and, in fact, went out with, and did a couple loops around the middle span of the Golden Gate Bridge, went down Market Street waving at the secretaries uh, as he was buzzing through town, and had uh, gotten so low that evidently he blew down somebody's laundry. And that woman uh, actually filed a complaint with General Kenny. Kenny knew, of course, that Bong's juvenile clouding was not altogether a bad sign. There's a long tradition of cocky fighter pilots indulging their whims. Indeed, Kenny knew that confidence and spirit were traits necessary for fighter pilots to survive in combat. Still, he was a general, and generals have to at least attempt to keep a lid on their pilots. He disciplined Bong regularly, making him wash, dry, and fold the laundry he had blown off the clothesline, for example but he also took note of the young pilot's enormous skills in the air. He actually spotted the spark, uh, I think, when he called him on the carpet in his office. Uh, you know, he was, I don't know what he was expecting when this pilot walked in the door, but here comes this, you know, average size, five foot eight, uh, blonde haired, baby faced uh, Swede, uh, who appeared to be scared to death that he was gonna lose his wings. Bong's passion for flight so impressed Kenny 
that when General Douglas MacArthur chose Kenny to set up the 5th Air Force Base in the Southwest Pacific, Kenny made sure that Bong was one of the first pilots sent to his new base in Australia. He arrived in September, springtime in the Southern Hemisphere. For more than a month, Bong sat around in Brisbane awaiting delivery of his plane. In November, Kenny assigned him to temporary duty with the 35th Fighter Group based in Port Moresby, New Guinea. New Guinea at the time was a hornet's nest of Japanese aircraft. MacArthur's campaign to reclaim the Philippines had just begun. American forces were beginning the bloody harbor-to-harbor -harbor conquest of New Guinea. The Japanese were throwing everything they could at the arriving American forces. The Army Air Force used a kind of sink-or-swim training method, throwing green pilots into the periphery of battles to ready them for full-fledged air combat. Flying under the careful tutelage of an experienced combat pilot, Captain Tom Lynch, Bong flew long patrols and skirted air battles for nearly a month, learning from Lynch the best tactics for fighting in a P-38. Then, on December 27, 1942, Bong got his first real taste of battle. He was in a flight of 12 P-38s led by Lynch. The flight intercepted 40 Japanese aircraft over Buma on New Guinea's northwest coast. Badly outnumbered, the P-38s charged headlong into the formation. Bong showed no sign of the fear he surely felt. He scored a Zero fighter and a Val bomber. Altogether, the P-38s knocked down a dozen Japanese aircraft. Bong, who had never been in real combat before, earned a silver star for his actions. From that point on, in dependable, almost unspectacular fashion, Bong began to compile what turned out to be the finest combat record in the history of American aviation. It took him only until January to become an ace, scoring his fifth kill over Leigh Harbor. In February, Bong left Lynch's shadow and returned to the 9th Fighter Squadron. On March 3rd, on the opening day of the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, Bong flew escort for a flight of B-25 and B-17 bombers attacking a Japanese convoy. Bong knocked down a zero. The bombers sank four Japanese destroyers and eight transports. One and two kills at a time, Bong upped his total. Kenny promoted him to first lieutenant and gave him a two-week leave in Australia. By then, a double ace, Bong enjoyed his R&R but longed to get back into action. The Japanese were throwing thousands of aircraft at the advancing Allies, creating aces almost as fast as the Allies could get pilots into the air. But Bong, perhaps uniquely among American pilots, seemed more interested in the experience and challenge of flight than he was in his kill count. He was an introvert on the ground, uh, shy even. Uh, in the air, became a different person, became the ultimate fighter pilot. On July 26, Bong had his best day ever. Escorting American bombers attacking Lei, he knocked down four Japanese fighters. General Kenny, who had been so impressed by Bong's skills in training, could barely believe how proficient a warrior the unassuming Swede had become. He put Bong in for a promotion to captain and filed an after-action report that resulted in Bong receiving the Distinguished Service Cross. Bong was, in fact, emerging as a leader in the almost unspoken competition among pilots to become the ace of aces, he became one to watch. The press started wiring accounts of his combat accomplishments back stateside, and his name started to be mentioned in speculation about whether an American pilot would break Eddie Rickenbacker's seemingly unbreakable record from World War I, 26 combat victories. In November 1943, Bong shot down his 20th and 21st enemy aircraft, a pair of Zeros over the airfield at Raval. General Kenny, knowing that his ace pilot was as valuable as a morale-building hero as he was in the air, gave Bong a 60-day leave to return home for a visit. Bong met with General Hap Arnold posed for a few pictures and then returned to Poplar, Wisconsin to enjoy, as ordered by Kenny, a little home cooking. The leading ace of the war was welcomed home as a hero, 
And while being crowned as honorary homecoming king at his old college, he met Marjorie Vattendahl, the 19-year-old homecoming queen. For the next two months, if he wasn't busy appearing at war bond rallies or launching ships for the war effort, he and Marjorie were together. By the time he left Poplar on the long journey back to the Southwest Pacific, he and Marjorie were in love. Captain Richard Bong returned to the Southwest Pacific as the leader in the race to become the Ace of Aces in hot pursuit of Eddie Rickenbacker's combat kill record. Bong slapped his girlfriend's picture on the nose of his new P-38, which he christened Marge. Five victories behind the record set by Eddie Rickenbacker in World War I, he went into battle with the whole world watching and an advantage over his competition. He was assigned not to the 9th Fighter Squadron, but to 5th Air Force Headquarters. In the competition to become Ace of Aces, the flyer with the most kills, Bong had become the favorite. The press had gathered to watch his achievement. While other pilots' assignments were limited to specific geographical areas where there might or might not be enemy activity, General Kenny allowed Bong to roam where he liked in search of action and Japanese planes to shoot down. But they increased slowly. The number of Japanese aircraft had decreased and the enemy was shifting to a more defensive posture. That limited the number of mass attacks that had created so many American aces. The Southwest Pacific was about as unnatural a habitat for the Wisconsin farm boy as it's possible to imagine. Hot, humid, bug infested and moldy, it was a place that seemed to reek of death. Bong went out almost daily, enduring long, boring patrols. Often he found no enemy aircraft at all. When he did, the combat lasted only minutes, and then a long return flight, often over open water to inhospitable accommodations. That was his reward. On February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day, Bong recorded his first kill in the plane he'd named for the girl back home, Marge. It was his only official kill for the month, though he did destroy a transport as it sat on the runway. The transport, it turned out, was loaded with high-ranking Japanese officers. And while it didn't count on his kill total, it struck a significant blow to the Japanese war effort. On March 8th, the tedium of the war turned to tragedy. Bong had reunited with his former commander from the 35th Bomber Group, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Lynch. The two were flying over a Tape Harbor, New Guinea. Bong watched helplessly as his old friend and mentor spun down to his death. For the next month, Bong was ineffective in combat. He flew, but he didn't score any kills until April 3rd, when he knocked down his 25th enemy aircraft. The press gathered in anticipation. The folks back home waited for word of Bong's heroism. On April 12th, Bong shot down three enemy planes in a single day, shattering Rickenbacker's record. The news flashed around the world. Rickenbacker sent a telegram congratulating Bong and promising to send a case of scotch as a reward. General Kenny, doubly pleased that the record had been broken by an officer in his command, sent a case of champagne. Back in the States, Middle America was scandalized that people would send alcoholic beverages to a pilot in a combat zone. To quell the uproar, General Hap Arnold made a big show of shipping Bong two cases of Coca-Cola. Arnold slipped the press copies of his personal note to Bong, stating that America's newest hero would certainly prefer America's favorite soft drink. Bong, still the cheerful, baby-faced kid from the North Woods of Wisconsin, was having a ball. What he didn't realize is that by becoming the ace of aces, he had become a national treasure too precious to risk in combat. After he broke Rickenbacker's uh, record at 26 victories, they did everything they could to the point of sometimes setting him down or sending him back on, uh, you know, publicity campaigns and things like that back in the States to keep him out of harm's way. He returned to the United States, went on a war bond tour, and most importantly, proposed to Marge Vattendahl. He didn't return to combat for five months, 
reporting to General Kenny in September 1944 as a gunnery instructor. He could fly, but he was only allowed to fire in self-defense. He defended himself a lot. He shot down five enemy planes in October and three more in November. Kenny suggested to General Douglas MacArthur that Bogg ought to get the Congressional Medal of Honor. MacArthur agreed and forwarded Kenny's request up the chain of command. In December, Bong went to Taklaban to receive the Congressional Medal from General MacArthur himself. In December, Bong shot down four more planes, bringing his total to 40. General Kenny, who had bent every rule to keep Bong flying, once and for all pulled him out of combat. He shipped his favorite pilot back home, armed with a personal letter to General Hap Arnold and six bottles of Coca-Cola for the flight. Bong arrived back in the United States on New Year's Eve, 1944. He went to Washington, met with Hap Arnold, and participated in what seemed like an endless stream of public appearances, including a press conference with Eddie Rickenbacker. He broke away in February and returned to Wisconsin. There, in the Concordia Lutheran Church, he and Marge married. After his honeymoon, Bong received the plum assignment of flight testing the P-80 Shooting Star, the first American jet. He made 11 flights in the P-80, immersing himself in the theory and engineering of jet engines. On August 6, he pointed the nose of his jet down the runway for his 12th flight. The plane rolled down the runway perfectly, but as it rose into the air, the engine flamed out. Here's a guy that had, you know, 200 missions, uh, combat missions in the Pacific, shot down 40 enemy airplanes, uh, was shot at on a daily basis, won the Congressional Medal of Honor, comes back to what's supposed to be a relatively safe, safe stateside job and uh, dies in an accident on takeoff in an experimental airplane, the P-80, in California. Dick Bogg, the ace of aces, died the day the Enola Gay dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. His death, which would have made headlines almost any other day of the war, made barely a ripple in the public consciousness on that particular day. The bomb had dropped. The war Bong had fought in so heroically was about to end. As the whole world prepared to celebrate the end of World War II, Poplar, Wisconsin mourned. In tiny Poplar Cemetery, Dick Bong came home for good.